Welcome. I hope you have been enjoying the day so far. My name is Anne Elvie, and this photo makes me look more outdoorsy than I really am. I want to begin with a question. You will have heard earlier about issues around reading ancient texts from a 21st century perspe ecological perspective. I want to suggest that we think of this as a cross or intercultural conversation. We recognise that our 21st century cultures and our particular ecological situations are different from those of the 1st century CE writers and readers of the Gospels, and indeed of the worlds imagined in the texts themselves, the worlds the Gospel characters inhabit. So, in what ways can we develop an intercultural conversation involving a 21st century context and a 1st century text? I'm going to look at two Lucan texts in a moment, briefly the parable of the Good Samaritan and a little more closely Luke 12, 54 to 56. As I speak, you may wish to think about what it is we see and what it is we ignore when we read and how are our readings shaped by our anthropocentrism and or our ecological awareness. For example, the Sunday before last, I took my mother to her local Roman Catholic parish. The Gospel reading was Luke chapter 15. Partway during the homily, the priest recounted an incident in a classroom when another priest was discussing the parable with a group of students and asked which character in the story was the unhappiest. Dutifully, all but one student answered, the older brother. But a boy put up his hand and said, the fatted calf. How do we recognise other than human creatures as active characters in the gospel story with interests of their own? Let me turn to Luke 10, 25 to 37, where we come upon a parable that highlights compassion, being moved in the guts to act with mercy toward the other. Here, it is a Samaritan who exercises compassion. The same word that is used in chapter 15 for the response of the father to his returning son. Can we recognise any other than human agency in the text? The setting is a dangerous road, away to and from Jerusalem. If we think in ecological terms of habitat, more than the road, habitat includes where the characters live, the places that sustain them, the earth products of human and more than human labour, such as the oil and wine they use. The idea of habitat also points us to the habitats of the author and readers of the text. There are a number of characters in the text. On one layer are Jesus and the lawyer, whose conversation prompts and frames the telling of the parable. At the parable layer are a traveller, brigands, a priest, a Levite, a Samaritan, a pack animal, and an innkeeper. I want to focus on one moment in the parable, the attention to the wounded traveller. Who or what is involved in the act of mercy? Most obvious is the Samaritan, who sees, is moved, and acts. There are also elements of oil and wine used by the Samaritan to wash and anoint the wounds. There's a pack animal that bears the wounded traveller, the innkeeper, even coins exchanged for the exercise of hospitality. So the act of mercy is not a single act, but an act of cooperation between humans, a pack animal, and a number of products of human and other than human labour, oil, wine, coins, their material properties, for example, for cleansing and healing, as well as the cultural and social meanings these hold. One way, then, of focusing an intercultural conversation with the ancient text may be to think about how our readings of the text, and perhaps the text itself, have been human-centred, and what might emerge if we expand our gaze to see the other-than-human actors that are often relegated to the background of the story. <laughs>
Another way of focusing such a conversation is to take a particular contemporary concern and bring this into dialogue with the text. One such, perhaps the central and arguably the most pressing, is climate change. We might see climate change as a sign of our time, putting us in what eco-theologian Sean McDonough calls a kairos moment. The notion of signs of the time finds resonance in Luke 12, 54 to 56. But he also said to the crowds, When you see the cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, A rainstorm is coming, and it happens thus. And when the south wind blows, you say, There will be scorching heat, and it happens. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the face of the earth and the sky, but how is it that you do not know how to interpret this season or time? Kairos. But he also said to the crowds, When you see the cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, A rainstorm is coming, and it happens thus. And when the south wind blows, you say, There will be scorching heat, and it happens. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the face. In the passage, it is assumed that weather prediction is unproblematic. Since, in a largely peasant culture, the ability to read or interpret meteorological signs could be assumed. The comparison with the ability to read or interpret the present time, this kairos, can be read in at least two ways. Is it that the crowds are incapable of interpreting the present time? Or is it that they correctly interpret the present time but pretend otherwise? In either case, they are judged by their inability to interpret the present time adequately. What does the capacity to interpret this kairos mean for Luke? The local narrative context suggests a tone of judgment. Luke 12, 54-56 occurs immediately after talk of crisis and stress. Violent upheaval is in tension with a promise of peace. In verses 50, 49 to 53, the primary example of division is within families or households. Because reception of the divine purpose is so critical for Luke, this purpose occasions division between those who reject and those who welcome the divine visitation, even within the same household. At verses 54, as verses 54 to 56 imply, the focus is not on division itself, but on interpreting the present time. The present time, this kairos, is, marked, is a time marked by Roman occupation, debt slavery, and the divisions within families these political and social conditions may bring. For Luke, temporal events of oppressive force, such as Jesus' execution and the Roman siege and destruction of Jerusalem, become enmeshed with a divine necessity that, in the midst of devastation, enacts and promises peace. But failure to respond adequately is always possible in Luke's present time. The present time is the today of salvation. A time of fulfilment. The kairos is imagined as seasonal time 
that marks the time of sowing, harvesting and feeding. This time of sowing, harvesting and feeding is the time of the imminence of the Basileia of God requiring response. But what does it mean to interpret this time? While the verb dokimadzo, to interpret, occurs 20 times in the Second or New Testament outside Luke, it appears only twice in Luke. In 12.56, the verb relates to interpreting both the face of the earth and the sky and the present time, this kairos. In 14 verse 19, it relates to trying out a new group of oxen. In these two instances, the Lucan usage relates to a physical discernment, probably related to agriculture, through discernment of the weather and the ways of animals, admittedly to serve human purposes. The linking of physical everyday signs with the present time may indicate that this kairos is a material reality requiring interpretation in close association with the signs of earth, sky and human political and social institutions such as the ancient structures of credit and debt. Does the capacity to read the movements of earth and sky, the shifts of wind for example, show an interconnectedness between God's time, this kairos, the time of visitation, and the physical climate which might encompass not only meteorological states but also political and social ones. The local narrative world is one in which God is active in opening the storehouses of the skies for the wind and the rain to come, as well as in opening a space in the oppression of Roman occupation and the related intransigence of some of the religious authorities for the visitation of peace and liberation, aphasis. The capacity to interpret this kairos is for Luke evident in a quality of responsiveness to the unsettling but liberating vision visitation of God with implications for social relations in Luke's present. Luke's use of a meteorological metaphor suggests that social relations are embedded in wider more than human relations. The weather matters to the crowds because it has implications not simply for their comfort, but for their sustenance, for the conditions under which their food supply is grown, harvested, and their households subsist, if not flourish. The social reality of credit and debt matters to the crowds, because it too has implications for their survival. The visitation of God in the present time should, the Luke and Jesus argues, therefore also matter the crowds because it speaks to these conditions of their survival in such a way as to open up the possibility of liberation from life-denying systems. When we look at Luke 12, 54 to 56 from the perspective of climate change now, there is an irony that, inter that in interpreting our present time, rather than arising as a contrast with interpreting the weather, requires instead interpreting the weather as a priority. The challenge of Luke is not to stop here, but to ask in what way our response to this present material situation can be understood as called forth as a response to the visitation of God, a liberating vision that might make another future possible.